pleasure to be here with you today. And it's, uh, it's a little intimidating because there's people from all sorts of uh, connections that I have, uh, from my church, uh, from my other friends, uh, uh, colleagues, students, um, so family. Um, so I told Gail this morning that uh, it seems like we have everybody from the dean to my daughter is, uh, in the audience. And uh, so, um, so I won't tell you who's uh, Criticism I'm most concerned with, uh, but uh, it's, it's not to be. Uh, so, okay, so I just have a, a, a few goals for my presentation. First, I would want to use it to thank the people that have helped me receive this award. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, uh, these things are teamwork, um, and it takes many, many people to uh, accomplish uh, these kinds of research projects. Uh, I want to give a brief overview uh, of, the, um, of uh, the, the work we actually did. Um, and we work in uh, several different fields. Uh, so I picked the field that is the, maybe the most accessible and also uh, one of the ones that is uh, more of our current activity. And then I want to uh, mention some of the lessons that I learned along the way, as well as some of the reflections on the work that we did. Um, so. So very broadly speaking, uh, our work is focused on the idea of uh, making technology smaller. And there's actually lots of things in technology that are getting smaller. And I'll just give you one example here, which is the pacemaker. And so in 1960, the pacemaker was about the size of a small mug. And this is going into your chest cavity. Oh, I need to turn on my microphone. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and since then, you can see that it has been coming down in size uh, significantly. Uh, over the course of about 50, 60 years. And so now it's about the size of a, a sugar, sugar cube. And you can imagine that that is, uh, has a great advantage. Uh, it makes the operation, the implantation, much more uh, amendable and less invasive. Uh, it also means that the body has a much uh, lesser reaction to having this implanted. Um, and so there is benefit to making uh, these technologies smaller. Well, uh, computers have been getting smaller for many, many years, actually. And um, Gordon Bell uh, observed this in the 70s, that with every new generation of computer, we're shrinking them size, uh, down in size over time. Uh, and you can see that started with the mainframe, which was probably about the size of this room, uh, to then the mini computer. It wasn't really so mini, like a closet. Uh, then the workstation, a personal computer, laptops, which we're familiar with, smartphones. And then the smallest current sort of uh, class of computing is the uh, IoT, the Internet of Things, uh, little gadgets, Fitbits, and things like that that connect to the Internet and also sense their environment. Um, and so uh, looking at this graph, we then thought that uh, it would be great to kind of, uh, you know, progress this trend. Now, it's important to remember uh, that this is not a law of physics. This is just an observation. So there's nothing that uh, demands or makes this happen. It's just that we as a collective uh, body of people have been making progress in this manner. And if the trend holds, we would see a further progression in this way. Uh, so. Uh, for ourselves, we made the goal to make a one millimeter computer. So an entire computing system uh, shrunk down to a single millimeter. Now, it would be very nice to think that uh, this is where we started. That we saw this law, uh, inspired us, uh, and then we would start working on it. And, and of course, that's not really how research works. And so uh, what actually happened uh, in 2004 um, is that this is a, a slide from the uh, presentation by one of our students, Bozai. And he, uh, we gave him the task to look at uh, at what voltage does the circuit become most optimal in terms of its energy consumption. It's sort of a very theoretical question. Uh, and so he analyzed this, and it turns out that he was one of the first to kind of analytically express this. And there is actually a voltage at which it's optimal. Um, and then we thought, well, it would be interesting to start making circuits at that voltage. It's actually quite challenging because the voltage, is, if you can read this, is quite small, around 200 millivolts, uh, much below the kind of circuits most people were building at the time. Um, and then from that, we like, wow, now we have these very low power circuits. Uh, and then we realize, oh, we can actually use this to maybe make computing systems smaller. Um, and so to explain that, let me back up uh, a little bit and think about a computing system. So a computing system has three parts. Uh, first, we need to get some information into the computer. So uh, we need an input device. Um, and so typically, that's a keyboard. 
And keyboards are very large. Uh, so that would be uh, a limitation on being able to make a computing system small. Uh, but we were fortunate uh, that actually around this time, uh, miniature sensing transducing elements had been developed, little sensors, uh, that can be uh, smaller than a millimeter or maybe a millimeter in size. Um, and so that allows us to actually get the information into the computer from one of these little sensors, which we can integrate and then maintain this very small uh, goal of size. And in fact, uh, this is where our work links to Ken Wise's work, because Ken Wise, as Minyang already explained, was really the pioneer of these tiny little sensing devices. Uh, he made lots of different sensing modalities, uh, uh, acceleration um, and, and uh, pH and other things uh, that would allow you now to feed that data into a computer uh, without actually needing a large size. And so uh, Ken Wise was really uh, instrumental uh, in us being able to take this further. Uh, and it really our work in a real way uh, builds on his work. Uh, and so that's been really uh, a great thing uh, in terms of uh, being able to uh, have his name as this collegiate professorship. Um, okay, so then the next part you need is that you need to, after you do your computing, you need to output the information. Um, and so you normally we use a, a display, uh, but again, that's not something we can scale, but also again, around this time, very small uh, wireless uh, communication came around uh, and so uh, we started working uh, on little radios. In fact, Tony Gerbic uh, was a collaborator with that, who's a great researcher. Uh, and so we were able to output the data through wireless communication and then it goes into the web and then you can just find it on your cell phone. Okay, so we can get data into the computer and out of it. Uh, so then what about everything in between? Uh, so we need uh, chips and we need batteries, we need packaging. So we need actually quite a bit of other things. Um, so, uh, if we look at uh, going from a laptop size to a little moat size, um, then you can see that actually the chips along this same time span have been shrinking uh, quite dramatically. So chips actually are not the limiting factor on making a very small system uh, because we can make tiny little chips now, much smaller than a millimeter, that can be, uh, have all the, all the circuits for uh, a little computer. Um, but what is the issue is actually the battery. Uh, and if you look here at a laptop, around 33% uh, of this volume is dedicated to the battery. And then to the smartphone, it becomes 44. And then when we look at a little, these early little modes, as much as 88% of their volume, of their size, was actually battery. And so what became clear is that uh, in order to shrink these systems down, uh, we have to actually shrink down the battery. That's our limiting factor. And that means that we have to be able to survive on really small batteries, and that can only be done if we have very low power circuits. Uh, and so that's why we saw that our low power circuit techniques could really enable shrinking down uh, these systems. So uh, we then ask ourselves the question, well, so how much power can we really draw out of these little batteries? Um, and so what we did is we actually made one. Uh, so this was custom built by the Simbad Corporation. Uh, and it's one by two millimeters. It's about uh, 250 microns thick. It's a tiny little battery. It uh, is next to this uh, AA battery. Uh, it has a million times less capacity than that AA battery. Uh, if you powered your cell phone with this, it would power on for 100 milliseconds. Okay. Now, my daughter's here, and she's really fast at texting. Uh, but you would have to be really, really fast to get a text out in 100 milliseconds. So, um, so we asked the question. So how much power could we actually consume? And then when we did calculations, that turned into around a nanowatt. Uh, and that was interesting because at the time, most people were computing uh, and having circuits that were in the microwatt. Okay? Uh, and so that meant that we need to go from microwatt to nanowatt. That's a factor of 1,000. Um, so that was kind of then our challenge uh, to try to uh, get to this goal of these small systems. So we had a lot of fun making different kinds of systems and building up a very, from very small to more and more complex things. We started with just a processor and a memory. We were, talking, uh, we were collaborating with Todd Austin at the time um, on a subliminal processor. Um, and then we progressed further and we added more and more components to it. Um, and what we found was um, that every time we 
lower the power on a certain component inside the computer, there would be another component that would be there and it would be sticking out and its power would become the kind of limiting factor. And so we had to keep pushing down the power of these different components each time we would have to move to a new one. Uh, and so Dennis likes to refer to this as the whack-a-mole game. Um, and so I'm very happy that I could find this early picture of Dennis as a graduate student. Uh, he was, uh, still had much more hair at the time. Um, and so uh, uh, we had great passion as we whacked down uh, the different uh, circuit power consumptions. So uh, I just want to give you two uh, quick examples of this because I have to show you some transistors. Um, so the first one is a voltage reference. And so this is a, a circuit that does only one thing. It actually outputs a constant voltage, regardless of temperature, regardless of battery charge. Uh, and that's all it does. But it's actually a very difficult circuit. Uh, and it was invented in 1974. It has this topology. It's called the band gap. Uh, it's probably the most referenced paper in our field. Um, and uh, what you can see here over time, uh, the different publications, uh, and most of them were focused on this topology, um, and their power was around uh, a microwatt. Okay? And you can see that not much moved for many, many years. And so actually then our student Mingu Suk, uh, who's now a professor at Columbia, uh, on his own came up with this new topology. It's actually very simple. It's only two transistors. Uh, and down here is the equation of uh, the output voltage. And if you tune this just right, it outputs a very constant voltage, it turns out. Um, and, uh, and its power consumption uh, was way, way less. And so what you can see here is that there was maybe some inklings of bringing down the power. And then we published this, and it was about five orders, four orders of magnitude uh, lower power than what had been published before. Uh, and then you can see that after that, actually, I think it encouraged the community to say, oh, can we go lower? Um, now, this wasn't the ideal circuit. So a lot of people have been doing other work, uh, including ourselves. Uh, but it sort of created a new trend uh, in the field. Um, one of the interesting lessons we learned from this uh, paper is that we submitted this to ISCCC, our top conference, and it was squarely rejected. Um, and then we submitted it to the second best conference, and it was again rejected. Okay. Uh, so then finally we went to a sort of more second tier conference, and it was finally accepted. Uh, but since that time, this paper has been referenced 260 times, uh, which is in our field quite a bit. Um, it's actually one of the more reference papers. Um, and it shows you that some of your best work actually may get rejected from great conferences. Uh, and so that's always an encouragement that we try to tell to our students. Uh, what we don't tell them is that some of your worst work is also rejected from those conferences. <laughs> so you don't always know, but that gives you some sense of optimism. Um, so um, the second circuit, and, uh, and then I'll move on to other things, um, is a timekeeper. Uh, so we need to know time on these little computers. We need to know what time of day it is so they know what to do when. Uh, and the conventional way of doing this is with what's called a Pierce oscillator. It's a crystal oscillator. Um, and, uh, and you can see again here in terms of publications in the years uh, that there really wasn't any publication on this uh, in the top two conferences. Uh, for uh, all these years, about 15 years. Um, and so, uh, and then what happened was that uh, we worked with our student and we came up with a new topology. It was really very, very different. Um, and so we published it. It was about 10x better than the next nearest paper, which was published in a, a much more obscure conference. Um, and then it created this new kind of enthusiasm. Uh, where actually two years later, we were really surprised. Somebody took our topology, improved it, um, did some more innovation on it, and published it. And we were actually rather annoyed because we thought we were the lowest. Uh, and then they beat us, and then somebody else beat it further, and then we came back, but we didn't quite beat them. And then eventually, we're very happy now in 2020, we'll be presenting a new paper, which is the lowest power, because oscillator is very important. Um, so, um, so you can see uh, that we had a lot of fun uh, making these low power circuits. And, um, whacking one mole after another. And it, the one of the lessons we learned from this also is that when you set a system level goal, like we're going to make a very small little computer, uh, it raises a lot of new problems that you would otherwise not be solving. Uh, and it also leads you into new fields. Um, so as Dennis said, uh, we now work in analog computing. Um, we actually, I'm on the committee of the analog committee at IC, which is a little bit scary. Um, uh, because I'm just new to that field. Uh, we're actually working in RF. Um, and so uh, along the way, this opened up lots of new uh, avenues uh, for us. Um, and so that's been very, uh, that's been very interesting. 
Um, so we started in 2004. Um, we built lots of different circuits. And then in 2011, we actually completed our first complete uh, little computing system. And it was an interocular pressure sensor. It's intended to go into your eye to pressure, measure pressure uh, for glaucoma patients. Um, it had a power consumption of 5 nanowatts, uh, which is uh, the target that we were shooting for, nanowatt computing. Um, and it can run on its internal battery for a couple weeks. Um, and so when we published this, uh, it was really interesting uh, what happened. Because right after publication, we started getting lots of requests uh, for units uh, of this kind. Um, uh, people from various different backgrounds. So we have environmentalists contacting us, neuroscience people, oil people, um, biology people, and they all wanted a sensor. They were not circuit designers. They were people that were requesting, like, could we have one of your sensors and we would like it to do this. Okay, now, uh, it wasn't that easy because they all wanted different things. Um, and so uh, this raised two kind of challenges for us. The first was, how do we uh, try to address all these different kinds of ideas and applications, uh, because they're all different. Uh, and to do so, we went to a much more modular approach, uh, which you'll see some pictures of later. And the second, which I want to talk about more, uh, was that they were not interested in a paper. Uh, they were interested in actually working units. Um, so, uh, and although, um, you know, this was a working unit, it kind of worked like a few times. Um, <laughs> And so, if you know how research goes, you do research, you get it back, it's mostly okay, you tweak this, tweak that, you know, hold your breath, blah, 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 get your measurement, publish a paper, right? And then the students are very ready to move on to the next project, okay? And then you lose the know-how, and you, it's very hard to then bring that further in terms of making that more correct and fully functioning. So, this raised for me the question, you know, do we or not go to really deployed systems? And what does it take and what would we need to do to make these systems really work um, so they can be really used uh, by people? So that's where I want to segue into a little bit more of a personal account um, and some of the factors that influenced me uh, in this aspect. So the first one is my dad. Um, and so that's my dad. Um, and he was actually a computer pioneer. He worked with Aiken at Harvard in the early 50s. And was actually working on some of the very first computers, uh, the Mark II and the Mark III. Um, and then he went back to the Netherlands. And in the Netherlands, they had their first computer uh, in a mathematics centrum. And uh, that was also a computer similar to ours. It sort of worked, but not really. Um, and so then they asked uh, my father to build the next generation computer for them. Um, and he was very good at making things very robust. Um, and so he actually made a computer that really worked. Uh, and it was actually used for airplane modeling and things like that. And then after that, he went back to the United States in 1964, which is the year I was born. Um, the IBM 360 was released. Um, and that is the computer that he was the uh, chief architect for. Um, so uh, this was really uh, one of his uh, chief uh, uh, accomplishments other than uh, having a son as well. Um, and, um, and this was also the first commercially successful computer for IBM, and arguably in the world. Um, and so my dad really liked to take a uh, talk about the importance of making things really work, what that would do for your work and your research, uh, and how that would, you know, could actually impact and influence people. Uh, it's probably uh, valid to say that he had some disdain uh, for uh, efforts that would not really work and were just ideas. Um, so this influenced me. So going chronologically forward, um, in 2007, 70, sorry, 1970, um, uh, I was a first grader and I was diagnosed with dyslexia. Um, and actually it turns out I have dyslexia uh, rather severely. Um, and uh, this is in a different day and age. Uh, this is in a day age where dyslexia was barely known, and it was certainly not accommodated. So the response we got was, well, that is really uh, unfortunate, uh, but you still have to live up to the exact same standards as everybody else, because that's how the world works. 
Um, and for me, that was very hard. And I, I didn't know exactly how to visualize this, so I have a little sidebar on my computer where I write down little words that I find amusing or annoying um, or that I don't get. Um, and so this is just a quick screenshot of that. Um, so, um, but what my dad did is that he took me uh, every morning um, before uh, breakfast, uh, before school, and he would sit with me for 30 minutes, and he would train me on spelling and reading, and he would go over things with me. Uh, and he did this from first grade uh, all the way uh, through high school. Um, and I actually calculated the number of hours, and it was about 2,000 hours that he poured into this. Um, and if you think about it, 2,000 hours is one person's annual work. Okay. So he poured uh, one year uh, of effort into it, and I was also there, of course. Um, and <laughs> and this, uh, this taught me uh, the, the value of perseverance, because dyslexia is not something you overcome just by working on a little bit and then you're okay. Right? This, is, uh, this is something that takes a tremendous determination and time to overcome, um, and, and a lot of effort. Uh, and so I think it also taught me uh, the, what can happen if you just sort of stick with something. Um, okay, going forward in time again. Uh, so I went on sabbatical with my family in 2007, 2008, uh, and we went to Australia. And so I spent a lot of time talking to kangaroos. Um, this one is particularly cute. Um, and I also spent time reading philosophy, and particularly with philosophy uh, of technology. And, uh, and in philosophy of technology, the key question is whether technology has value. And by what they mean with that, uh, what they mean by that is whether or not technology, when it enters into society, whether it has an innate force to change that society in a certain direction. Uh, so for instance, uh, if you think about the introduction of TVs into our society, did that change the discourse that we have as a society to become more image-based and less reasoned argument-based, for instance? Uh, and I think the, uh, the answer to that is that it's probably true. Technology brings some kind of transforming factor into society when it enters. Um, and so that then raises the question of uh, what value should we pursue with our technology because we would then bear some responsibility for this. Uh, and that is a question of belief and faith. Uh, and for me, that is rooted in the God as described in the Bible. Uh, and so I went to the Bible. Uh, and this particular verse was particularly useful to me. And it says that the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Okay. And so this is an early blueprint of what God intends for mankind to work. Uh, so that is entailing all of the sort of cultural and societal activities that we do. And the purpose being to keep the garden. And that word keep is the Hebrew word shamar. And uh, that actually has a sense uh, of guarding and of protecting uh, and to take care of and fostering. So it has a very protecting kind of aspect to it. Um, and, uh, and so this uh, made me wonder about how can we take our technology and uh, make it happen in this direction, make it impact things in this direction. Now the problem with technology, for anybody that's ever made technology, is that the moment you make it and you publish it and you release it, right, it gets away from you. You know, who knows what people will do with it and how they will change it and where they will use it, right? Uh, and so one of the things that uh, sort of motivated me was that, well, that is true, but at the same time, uh, I can take my own technology and try to carry it forward further towards an application that I think is actually worthwhile, uh, where it would be keeping and protecting, maybe especially for uh, underserved populations. Um, and so that was uh, another factor uh, in sort of wanting to bring these systems really to a working state. Um, so we actually uh, did that, and we actually found an underserved population which is the, uh, the snails in Tahiti. And um, now, in the 1950s, um, there were about 50 different snail species in Tahiti. And uh, at that time, there came in an Asian snail, a, uh, a, uh, a foreign species, and this snail started eating the plantations. And so they didn't like this. And so a decision, an ill-fated decision, was made to bring in another you know, invasive species from Europe. Okay? And that was a predator snail. 
Uh, and the idea was that it would eat the Asian snail. Now, I didn't know that snails eat each other. I, you know, but actually, if you think about it, if you're a predator snail, uh, even though you're slow, you just have to be faster than the prey snail. And so, uh, in fact, they do exist, and they do eat each other. I can show you videos. It's quite amazing. Um, now, what happened with two year, within two years is that uh, the predator snails did not eat any of the Asian snails, but they ate all of the Tahitian snails. And so they all went extinct. And it's funny, but it's also very, it was actually a huge calamity. Um, all of them, except for two species, uh, and those are the ones shown there. And they were really interested uh, how these two species have survived for the last 60 years uh, under the pressure of this same predator, which is still there on the island. Uh, and while the others have all gone extinct. Uh, and they're particularly interested in this one with the white shell. And their hypothesis was that because it has a white shell, it could survive in warmer temperatures under more direct sunlight than the predator snail, than the European snail. But they had no way of confirming this. And so what they contacted us, um, and we spent uh, quite a bit of time making little sensors, a little computing systems that would log the light level that you could stick on these snails. Um, so we built uh, 200 of these systems. We had uh, no uh, funding for this, um, and um, no valid funding for this. And, and then we took those units, 55 to Tahiti, uh, and we ended up bringing 40 back. We lost seven somewhere in the forest. And uh, only eight of the units failed, which was for first deployment. For us, was a, a big success. Um, we, uh, we also uh, showing here the, the two snails. This is the, uh, your, the Tahitian snail. We, we're not allowed to put sensors on them, so we put it next, but they don't move. Um, and here's the, the predator snail, the European snail. He looks very cute, but he eats other snails. Um, and uh, it was interesting, but it was really uh, uh, sort of changing for us was, uh, was the data that we were able to read out. And so this is the data. I won't spend a lot of time on it. This is throughout the day the average light levels experienced by the, uh, the Tahitian snail. And in red is the light level of the predator snail. And you can see the predator snail is clearly staying away from light. And the Tahitian snail is able to survive in that light. And so they call this a solar refuge. Um, and what was interesting to us is that this was the first time they could see this data. And there was really no other way to get this data. Uh, because you have to instrument these little tiny snails. Um, and so uh, it showed for us that, wow, uh, when you deploy these systems, you can actually uh, find new information. And in fact, uh, now there is talk about creating more solar refuges uh, for these snails so they have more spots in the forest, in the, in the jungle, to where they can uh, have this light exposure. OK, so, uh, so that was kind of our journey. Uh, so it took from 2004, we started working on all of these uh, circuits. We put it together in 2011. Uh, and then it was uh, in 2017 that we actually had our first really working system. So it took us an additional six years to get there. And I would argue uh, that this was probably uh, the more arduous uh, part of the journey. Um, so uh, um, and it, the year is interesting because my father passed away in 2018. And so I was born when he produced his first sort of you know, big working system. And we were able to just show him uh, ours uh, before he passed on. So, um, so uh, now you may ask, uh, what else have you done? So we have now since that time uh, gone and used this in different applications. We're looking at um, tracking monarch butterflies and tumor, uh, tumors for uh, breast cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we've also vastly expanded uh, our set of different kinds of sensors uh, from pH sensing, uh, being able to record images and audio, et cetera. So now, of course, if you're a researcher, you're like, well, that was nice. You went down to a millimeter. Can you go lower? Right? And so in fact, uh, we did. Uh, and so this is now the world's smallest little computer. It's sitting next to a grain of rice. Uh, it's 500 times smaller than that grain of rice. Um, and when we made it, we actually didn't really know what it would be good for. Um, we, uh, but we thought it would be interesting to make. And, um, and uh, it's actually still not really useful for anything. But then we started working with uh, Cindy Chestek, who is an amazing researcher. Um, and so uh, we have now deployed the same technology that we put into here into little neural probes that can go inside your brain uh, and record your neural signals. And this actually Cindy is starting to use uh, to restore limb function for people that are paralyzed. Um, so 
Um, now, at the end of the day, therefore, we have been able to look, go back to this graph and we've been able to add sort of two new dots to this uh, plot, uh, one slightly larger than a millimeter and the other one somewhat smaller. Uh, and then Dennis coined this new term, he calls this the Internet of Tiny Things, uh, so IoT square. Um, and so we'll see if this becomes the next class of computing, uh, but it certainly is uh, already seeing some interesting uh, applications. Um, and if you want to ask me if we can go even smaller, well, I don't know. We'll see. Um, so I want to really thank our collaborators. Um, so I put up their pictures here. These are only the ones from the last 10 years. Um, and this morning I had a heart attack because I realized I forgot somebody. So that tells you that probably I still forgot somebody else as well. Um, and uh, one of the great things of coming to Michigan has been able to work with these people. Uh, and it has been uh, truly a pleasure to have all of these collaborations. Um, the second thing, I want to just acknowledge our amazing administrative support. Uh, so these are the people that I've worked most closely with to administrative support, uh, and they have been an incredible support uh, for getting us through all of the different paperwork and everything else that needs to happen uh, for us to be able to uh, do the research. Um, so uh, Sarah and Fran, our direct admins, could not be here today. Sarah has a, uh, a very new baby, and Fran is sitting on the beach in Mexico. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, but they're here in spirit. Um, okay, these are our students. Uh, I kind of ran out of steam putting up pictures. Um, so, and this includes our master's students and students that we collaborated with. These are not all my own PhD students. Uh, but these are all the students that were involved in various projects that we have done uh, together as a part of collaboration. I'm sure they're not all here. Uh, but it shows you how many. Uh, and I also uh, want to say that you know, some of these are the most creative and brilliant people uh, that we have had uh, fortune to work with. So, uh, and then finally, I just want to acknowledge uh, uh, my friends, uh, some of you uh, that came, thank you, uh, braving the weather. Uh, my family, of course, and of course, Gail, my wife, uh, where would I be without her? And then uh, I just want to also again acknowledge Ken Wise for his great contributions and for uh, really setting the stage for what we could then build a top of. Um, and actually, I got to work with his last PhD student uh, on a collaboration, so that was really uh, a great uh, privilege and pleasure. Uh, so uh, thank you all for coming uh, today uh, and for listening to this talk.